In her book Hunt Gather Parent, Micheline Dukleff explores what ancient cultures can teach us about the lost art of raising happy, helpful little humans. I myself have two little humans under my care and would love for them to be both happy and helpful, so I've been spending a lot of time with the ideas in this book. And in this video, I'm going to share a visual summary for each of the three main topics of the book how to raise helpful kids, how to teach kids emotional intelligence, and how to raise confident kids. If you enjoy this type of visual book summary that I'm about to share and want to learn how to create something similar, I've got a series of live trainings coming up where I will teach you how to take visual notes while we all read the same book together. In our September program, we'll be reading the book The Atlas of the Heart by Brene Brown. In October, it will be Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. And in November, it will be The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. If you would like to learn more about those programs, check out the link in the description. Let's get into Hunt Gather Parent. Here's what Sunday mornings look like for my family. After breakfast and some playtime at home, my wife and our twin boys, who are almost two, head to a local coffee shop, spend some time catching up, and then pull out a few recipe books to do some meal planning for the week. And then we all head to the grocery store. This simple weekend routine is part of our strategy for raising helpful kids, a topic that Micheline Duclef explores in her book Hunt, Gather, Parent. And in this video, I would like to summarize some of my favorite ideas from this section of the book, in which Duclef spends some time with a Maya community in the Yucatan who are really good at raising helpful kids. And that's where Duclef is introduced to the concept of acomedido, this character trait that the children within this Maya community all seem to have, where they do an amazing job of paying attention to their surroundings, recognize what chores need to be done, and then they do them without prompting. That sounds like a dream come true for all of us parents out there, but it probably also sounds almost like a fantasy. How do you get kids to do that? That's what this section of the book explores, starting as early as you can by valuing toddlers, recognizing that kids actually enjoy helping if the impulse isn't stifled. She shares the fact that toddlers everywhere have two things in common. They will have tantrums and they have an eagerness to help. They want to take part in whatever it is their parents are doing, which is why togetherness is the overarching principle of this section of the book. Before kids can inhabit that trait of acomedido on their own, they first need to be taught it while working alongside you. There are a few requirements for doing this well. First of all, the tasks that you take on with your kids need to be real. It's not about buying a fake toy lawnmower or a plastic kitchen set because kids know the difference between a toy and the real thing. And that task should also make a real contribution to the family. The task should also be doable for your child or almost. It's not about giving them a knife to chop vegetables when they're a year and a half old. It's about finding some small subtask related to the thing that you're doing that they can actually help with. For example, what we've been doing with our boys when washing dishes is letting them do the rinsing. We are next to them doing the scrubbing with the sponge and the soap, and then they get to hold the dish under the water and rinse it off. The third requirement here is to never force a task. Forcing your kid to help in a particular way can severely undermine motivation, and it also builds tension between you. So you're always presenting it as an offer for them to help alongside you. Duclef also suggests giving your kids a metaphorical or perhaps literal team membership card because kids want to feel that they're full-fledged contributing members of the family. And what comes along with that membership are both benefits and responsibilities. For example, one benefit that our boys have is access to plenty of books and toys. Along with that benefit comes the responsibility of cleaning up when we move on to the next thing. And that act of cleaning up is probably the easiest way to practice these skills with your kids, not waiting until they're down for their nap for you to do all the cleaning, but instead to do it together and to make specific requests for help. Asking your child to go pick up those books or go put the balls away. Focusing on those three requirements of it being a real task, doable or almost, and never forcing it. That never forcing it piece is deeply tied to motivation. And specifically what we're interested in here is helping kids develop their intrinsic motivation to help out. Duclef shares the important ingredients of intrinsic motivation as she tells the story of a family making tortillas. 
Those components are connectedness, the child feeling like they're part of the team, as well as competency, the child feeling that they are capable of doing the task, and autonomy, the child feeling that they are the one making the decision to act. So you can all be sitting around the same table, making tortillas together, giving the child a task that fits well with their current skill development, and then letting them do their own thing, not micromanaging the process. And then, equally important, accepting even the wonky results that might come from that process. They're not going to make perfect tortillas at the beginning, but you can still accept and use them even if they're wonky. Throughout the entire section of this book, and particularly within this discussion of intrinsic motivation, the topic of praise comes up. It's a little bit ridiculous how frequently we praise our kids. And while we think that that might be building their self-esteem, it turns out that too much praise can actually do some harm. In some situations, it can motivate a kid, but it can also demotivate them very easily too. And it's too much praise that leads to the development of external motivation, when what we really want to develop here is intrinsic motivation. Instead of praise, Duclef encourages us to simply accept or acknowledge their contribution. Accept those wonky tortillas. That's more important than exclaiming how wonderful you are for making a tortilla all on your own. You're such an amazing kid. To get practice with that approach, which won't at all be intuitive for most of us, Duclef presents the challenge of having a praise-free day. An entire day going without praising your child. See how hard that is. And also see how that impacts the behavior and attention of your child. Are they constantly looking to you for validation? Or are they given the space to engage with whatever's drawing their interest in that moment? Another important concept here is establishing and appreciating a two-way flow between you and your child. That's not about you dictating to your child how things must be done, but instead establishing more of a collaborative process. Here, Duclef shares the story of making kebabs with her daughter, with a bunch of vegetables and some chicken on hand. Duclef goes about making a very balanced kebab, with a variety of vegetables and some chicken thrown in, while her daughter makes a kebab entirely of chicken. Instead of telling her daughter, that's not how it's done, we need a balanced kebab. Instead, she accepts it, continues making kebabs herself, and sees that her daughter starts making more balanced kebabs too. So it's important to have this openness of knowledge flow between you and your child, and approach it with collaboration in mind. And there's a quote here, don't stop a child from doing something even if it's wrong. Let them make wonky tortillas. Let them make single ingredient kebabs. It'll be okay. There's also the important acknowledgement here that it's not always gonna be a clean process. In fact, more often than not, it will be messy. But it's important to recognize that the messiness of teaching is an investment. You've got to have the long game in mind. It's those messy teaching and learning experiences at age two, three, four, and five that will result in extremely helpful kids come age six, seven, eight, and on. And the overall formula that Duclef introduces here and then carries throughout the rest of the book is a three-step process of practice, giving your children the opportunity to practice new skills, as well as modeling the desired behavior yourself, and then, if needed, acknowledge the contribution that the child is making. Not through constant praise, but instead through occasional appreciative words. And if you're thinking to yourself, where am I gonna find all the time and energy? to do all of this teaching and collaboration with my kids. Duclef recommends that maybe you shift how you think about the experiences you provide for your kids, putting much less time and energy into child-centered activities, where you consider it your job to entertain the kids, and instead introduce more real life. Take your kids to the grocery store, bring them along to doctor's appointments, let them help in the kitchen, clean the house with them, Yes, that might mean that those activities take a little bit longer because of the teaching that you'll be doing and because of the messiness that will occasionally result, but it seems like in the long run, that's all going to be worth it because you're teaching them this lifelong skill of being helpful, of contributing to the family in a way that establishes a deep sense of belonging. That sounds like a pretty good family life to me, and I hope that I can put some of these practices into place. 
how to teach kids emotional intelligence. Here, Duclef is sharing some lessons that she learned while spending time with an Inuit community in the Arctic. And for this visual summary, I'll do a little bit of compare and contrast, sharing first the likely default reaction to dealing with toddlers or any young child that's still developing their emotional intelligence, and then perhaps a better way that leads to less conflict and frustration. One phrase that really stood out to me here was the volcano of verbiage that is perhaps the easiest way to respond to any misbehavior that we see in our children. This is that default reaction of trying to talk the misbehavior away, which might work if it's two adults communicating with each other, but for toddlers who are dealing with big emotions, lots of talking isn't the best way to communicate, because what all of those words do is convey urgency and stress, which doesn't really help the situation because it just raises the energy of the child as opposed to calming them down. And that can be the case whether those words are spoken in an angry tone or even in a positive optimistic tone. But whether we want it to or not, it's easy for us as parents for anger in response to misbehavior to creep its way in, which is why it was particularly interesting to hear about how within this Inuit community, any form of parental anger toward a misbehaving child was seen as a sign of immaturity because of course toddlers are going to misbehave. They're not yet fully fledged humans. So why are you getting angry about it? That's of course easy to say, but much harder to implement. So let's turn our attention next to the contrast of this volcano of verbiage with perhaps some dripping anger flowing its way into the interaction. Instead, let's go with a mellow meadow because the most important thing in these situations, as Duclef shares with us, is to model emotional regulation. That's the first step in teaching it to your child. Some of Duclef's initial observations about the parents that she was getting to know within this Inuit community was that in response to misbehaving kids, those parents took no quick actions, they didn't make loud demands, and they just radiated calmness. And that's how they prevented passing on this sense of urgency and stress and helped to lower the energy of the child instead of raising it. In order to be able to respond in those ways, the key for us parents is to have less or even no anger in response to those situations. And it's not even about suppressing or managing that anger, it's about not having it in the first place which can only happen when you've got a particular mindset, when you remind yourself that toddlers are illogical. They're still newbie citizens of planet Earth. Duclef encourages us to even shift the narrative away from toddlers testing boundaries or manipulating us, but instead assuming that their motivations are kind and good and it's just the execution that needs improvement. So considering that they are illogical beings, these newbie citizens to planet Earth, you can expect misbehavior instead of being surprised and angry when it happens. You can also keep that anger from cropping up by not arguing with your kids and not yelling loud demands. Instead, make a request and wait silently. If the child refuses, you can comment on it or just walk away and turn your attention elsewhere. But no nagging or negotiating or back and forths. That's what would get you back into that territory of the volcano of verbiage. So I would say the overarching idea here is fairly simple. Staying calm. It's simple, but it's not easy. At least not for me. But as you've probably heard before, your kids are going to learn more from your actions than from your words. So it's worth putting some intentional effort into those actions, or often in this case, inaction and calmness. The final topic that I want to explore in this video is how to raise confident kids. Here I'll bring in a specific analogy, that of your child walking on a tightrope to represent them participating in a potentially dangerous activity. In this section of the book, Duclef is sharing what she learned while spending time with a Hadzabe community in Tanzania. And one of the dynamics that comes up is the difference between independence and and autonomy. In the Western world, independence is often touted as a desirable quality where you don't have obligations to other people, but how that also results in you being disconnected from other people. Within this Hadzabe community, it's much more about autonomy. And this solar system analogy was used where you're each circling each other on your own path, but you're stabilized by the gravity of the community. 
You're able to make your own decisions, but you stay connected to each other. And allowing kids to make their own decisions and practice self-sufficiency is the main thing that will teach them confidence. Whereas parents who quote unquote help their children too much stress themselves out and leave their kids ill-prepared to be adults, to quote Duclef. A core belief of the Hadzabe community as it relates to autonomy is that it's actually harmful to control another person. Instead, there is this reciprocal relationship, this orbiting of each other, where you control yourself and I'll control myself. Duclef also points out how even praise is a way of controlling a child which kind of blew my mind a little bit. We talked about the negative impact of praise in the How to Raise Helpful Kids section, but it's equally interesting here to think about praise as a form of control, as a way of potentially limiting what your kids are capable of. So the main suggestion here is to, yes, give your children autonomy over their lives, but you don't disappear from the picture. You are still there providing an invisible safety net that the child doesn't even know exists until they need the help. You're there staying quiet and out of the way, but then you do hop in to help when needed, to step in and train them to handle specific obstacles and dangers. And the reason that one of those two people holding that invisible safety net has their mouth taped shut, that's you, the parent, is because more often than not, it's saying less that's gonna be the most helpful. Provide fewer offers to help. Issue fewer commands. Don't lecture all the time. Another belief here is that anything a parent says the vast majority of the time will only get in the child's way. So decrease the amount of talking you do, the commands you give, and really any other verbal input. This point echoes the volcano of verbiage that we talked about in the last section. What Duclef encourages you to seek out then are autonomy zones, relatively safe places where kids can practice autonomy, like parks, playgrounds, beaches, community gardens, or backyards, where you can set your children free and just observe, only intervening to prevent imminent danger or to teach or train about safety. The rest of the time, just stay out of the way. Within this Hadzabe community, Duclef also noticed how much emotional freedom children had. They weren't told to calm down, they weren't told how to feel, and there was no sense of urgency by the parent. That emotional freedom actually becomes a stabilizing force in their life. And then, finally, if all of these parenting tips are starting to feel overwhelming, if you feel like you have too much on your shoulders, then seek out alloparents. This is any person besides the parents who help take care of the child. It could be a relative, or a friend, or a neighbor, or even another child, anyone five years or older. This has benefits for both the child and the parents. The child is able to develop a deeper relationship and meaningful bond with multiple caregivers not just one or two, and allo parents provide social support for the parents and just general friendship and camaraderie. And here Duclef points out how we as humans evolved to share the duties of child care as a group and how the extreme focus on the nuclear family within Western society is pretty new and not all that helpful. And it's the seeking out and bringing in of these multiple caregivers that can actually serve as an antidote to depression that many parents fall into in the first few years of parenthood. As you have probably seen here, there is a lot to unpack within this book that does these deep dives into three interesting cultures. I hope that these visual summaries have helped you wrap your head around some of the main takeaways. If you've enjoyed this, I do encourage you to pick up the book yourself, dig deeper into these ideas, hear about more of the details as well as more practical tips for how to start implementing them in your life. And I also wanted to remind you of the upcoming book club programs where I will be teaching this skill of visual note taking while we read and sketch note interesting books like The Atlas of the Heart, Thinking Fast and Slow, and The Psychology of Money. You can learn more about those programs as well as other visual note taking resources at verbaltovisual.com. Thank you so much for watching this video. Good luck in your parenting journey, and I'll be back again soon with another visual book summary. See you then.